What's good, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to yet another episode of My Campus Talk, where we deal with your current political and economic issues. Yes, I'm talking about everything that affects you directly and indirectly. And today, as you can see, there's someone different on the second chair. Lina Laraki, Huzanta, we are a Mohel, let's say, you know? You know? Did I say that correctly? Yeah, yeah, you said it correct. I okay, <laughs> and just a disclaimer out there: you guys might hear me go Lawrence here and there. I'm I'm used to calling him Lawrence, but apparently that's his colonial name, so we don't do colonialism here today, right now. <laughs> so this gentleman here who looks so humble and lost is actually not so humble and lost. Not only is he a UJ student, he's also a volunteer for the South African Institute of International Affairs. You'd think I'm done, but I'm only getting started. He is the outgoing deputy chairperson for UNASA, the UJ chapter. He's also the national facilitator for the UN Security Council 2250. <laughs> He's a model UN tutor for Cambridge University's Courtney International College in Pretoria. And finally, he's the alumni network facilitator for Education South Africa. <sighs> Education Africa. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I had to get something wrong. Now, Lawrence, where, where do you get the time to study? I think that's everyone's thought right now. Where do you get a chance to study in the midst of all of this? Well, I think it's all about discipline, really, on how you time frame yourself into this is what's important today and this is what's important to tomorrow. Yeah. So if I know there's a test coming in the next two weeks, then I know, okay, I need to prioritize that test and not this particular conference. But if there's a conference that's happening on Tuesday, then I invest my time on that conference. So it's all about balance, making everything work and chasing for that. Yeah. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It's about balance. It is possible, you can, you can literally, you know how they tell you that don't have too many fingers in too many jars? You can have too many fingers in too many jars, just not at the same time, right? Correct. Yeah, so I'm not done with the introduction, I'm still introducing him. <laughs> He's well-traveled as well. Born in Matadiel. Matadiel. Yes, born and raised in Matadiel. This guy right here, just this year alone, he went to New York City, the United Nations headquarters. He visited Washington DC, the world's largest political hub, but actually we know it's just America's political hub, I mean. He went to Tennessee and he went to Kampala. Uganda, yes. Yeah, Kampala in Uganda. And do you know that royal, the famous royal reed dance in Swaziland? He was a guest of the Swati King, right? Oh yeah, it was part of the UJ delegation, we were part of the students that were called to witness that. It was part of the project there in Africa by bus to yeah. expose the Africa's traditions and cultures. So we were um, tasked to go down there and witness the real real dance. Okay, so if you're a UJ student and you come across this guy on campus, don't be shy to stop him and ask him about all of this jazz that he's doing because it's quite a lot. Now, unfortunately, we won't be talking about his big, big resume and everything around it. But fortunately, we will be picking his brain on the matter of customary law. We all heard this this week. I think if you're like me, you were quite shocked to find out that um, Lobola is not enough. There has to be actions that are taken uh, after the Lobola negotiations for someone to be considered someone's wife, you know? But now I'm bringing it to you. Up. I'm bringing it to you. How, how this whole ordeal with um, WHP's wife against the family taking each other to court, how, how do you see that, especially in a situation where you guys are mourning but now you're going to court? You know, is, is that African? Should it be African? Sh should, should it happen? Well, it's quite the sad thing that it's happening in the midst of the period when um, we preparing for the funeral and everything, um, we was wise enough to actually reserve it towards the end, maybe after the funeral and everything, but it was quite contradictory because now the wife can't attend the funeral because of this calamity that's happening. But customary law in South Africa is quite unique. Um, it's unique because each nation in itself historically has certain practices that, that need to be endowed in the current, in the yeah. current times as well. 
Um, a clear example is Saudi Arabia's Sharia laws. Yeah. So you can't just wipe those laws away and say, no, you need to go by these laws. We as Africa as well have our own customary laws. It's not just in South Africa, but throughout the African country. Yeah. So you need to respect these in marriage as well, and not just ritual practices. Okay, then for those couples who say, I'm Betty, and I meet a, a Kosa-speaking guy, right? Like, Certainly there are things in Bedi, in my Bedi culture that we do that Kosa people don't and they think that Kosa people do in their culture that Bedi people don't but those two people want to come together as husband and wife How do you think the different small and nuances affect the whole customary law part of it? Well, that's up to the domestic families themselves and how they decide to go about it It's much easier as you said if it's Bedi and Bedi because well, we interconnect and we know our culture is quite simple but if it's Kosa and Bedi and there's certain things that we don't go by, it's now up to the two families to say, okay, how are we going to engage into this? Because a clear example is a friend of mine, his um, mother was of a colored, a colored upbringing and his father was in mm. So now the family in his father's side said, okay, buddy, you have to come into the mountains now. And this is where the glitch comes in. The colored family does not believe in the whole ritual practice of going to the mountains. But it's a domestic factor when you now decide as a family and say, okay, how do we go about it? So it's, it's, it goes in that way. Um, with regards to marriage and customary law, it's very complex because we, we need to first define what Lobola is, especially. Yes. It's very important to define what Lobola is and how Lobola goes about. A lot of people confuse Lobola as um, this is a woman and she's uh, some form of a commodity and uh, the cattle that we are paying but over is, is some it, form of is it not though? I mean, it's not. Is because because growing up, that's that's what you see or you come to learn Lobola as. Whether it's a process where the guy's family brings money, right. and what they get in return is a woman. When you go to shop, you give them money, and you get bread. Yeah. You give them money, you get your product. So it seems like an exchange of I'm giving you my money, yeah. so you can give me your daughter. I'm here to buy your daughter. It's not, it's, not, it's not a factor of we buying. Okay, let's study um, Lobola, the inception of Lobola in Africa uh, before the whole process of colonization. Because modern time Lobola is EFT. I send you um, EFT yeah. wallet and then True. that's that's the Lobola. True, yeah. But traditionally, Lobola how it is, is that you need to present to the family living um, cattle per se. Mm -hmm. Depends on which family. Some present cattle, horses, just a Goats. bunch of livestock, right? But the reason why we bring you living cattle is to prove to you that these are walking and these their hearts are beating. You can see the cattle in front of you. Um, it can be 50 per se or whatsoever, but it's not a form of I pay you and give me your daughter. It's a form of a gift to say, look, this is the beginning of a relationship between these two families. These are the cattle we present to you. When you host a ceremony and you're going to slaughter one of these cattle, it's not an obligation, but it is some form of an obligation. It's not a say, it's an unsaid obligation that you need to invite me as a family because we have we some have form that. of titles. Okay. And as well as when I host a ceremony, I am obliged to invite you. So Lobola never finishes. Okay. You never finish. It's okay, fine. I will we get that. But this is the 21st century where Lobola is being paid. We don't have cows anymore. We substitute that for money. You know, and I can go, eh, hey, that back then you guys were buttering the cows anyway. So you basically kinda were buying a wife, you know? Right. Because you, you just you just had a sentimental attachment to it. Sentiment aside, you're still exchanging your cows, your wealth. Because livestock is a show of wealth. You right. know, you, you do ex you exchanging your wealth for a woman. But then it was a, it was an honorable thing to happen. But today you have a whole lot of independent, strong black women walking around who do pay homage to their culture and traditional beliefs. Correct. But there's just certain things that rub them off the wrong way. Are we saying it's time now that tradition and our elders sit back and reassess the situation to how the world is today? Or do we go, this is non-negotiable, this is what's going to happen and this is how it's going to go about? And wh it, it, where are we? Where should we be? Um, you're, you're correct when you say it's the 21st century. And we need to move with the times. But moving in the times, we also need to refrain from eroding our traditional practices and cultures as well. 
uh, it's very easy for us to say that we're treating women as commodities with the whole respect of Ilobol. Yeah. And then, as well as, it's very easy for us to say, you know what, um, particular practices of initiation school that takes place throughout the face of Africa, not just South Africa, but the face of Africa, need to be eroded away. It's, it's long done. But you don't dissect as to what really principles or what teachings is there that they teach to these young men and these young women mm -hmm. uh, in these particular practices or rituals that are really needed in society today. That's what is very important because um, rite of passage has a form of significance in how societies were okay. organized back then. The same thing with Lobo. So it's much as we bestow it as a sign of wealth and everything like that, but what significance does it bring behind, behind it. this thing of, okay, I'm really appreciating your daughter, because this, this is not just me, this I'm is, getting married to you, my entire family, coming, my uncles come before yeah. your family, these are the elders of the family, they yeah. say, look, we want to welcome your family. I, I guess to, to stop you here, but do you think the high rate of divorce amongst, forgive me, young black people today has to do with this whole commodity view of 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 lobola is it okay now that i don't show my appreciation now that i don't show my desire to marry your child look i want to marry your child yeah. so i'll just give you whatever money you want me to give you and i'll get my wife oh yeah do you think that kind of goes into the treatment of women in marriages those in horrible situations how people men feel entitled to their wives bodies to their wives time to their wives everything because they paid for her to be his wife do you think that disconnect in regards to actually this is why you do this you know does that or also is it also the death of some people that that whole sentimental value that your whole family came you know we, we are now connected it's a whole family thing and when the relationship becomes toxic and someone yeah. stays in it still because of the whole implications i mean well, yeah where well okay let me first address the divorce question i mean it's quite it's very foreign it, traditionally in african essence to divorce be, to be presented with okay this particular couples you know going for a divorce it's something that we don't really recognize in ourselves because mm. and this is also this notion that um, that has been happening for quite a long time that is even presented today in social media of women beggars of you need to withhold the pain and everything yeah, in marriage. Yeah. And that's that's not marriage um, a woman sustaining all that pain and anger and everything throughout the entire marriage is not marriage at all that's not the essence of marriage. what about the man what if what if it's the man in the relationship who's actually struggling mm. I think we need to, we as young men of Africa, need to dissect and really understand what are, as much as we speak of decolonization and everything, we need to understand who we are as a people. Yeah. What is the significance of a woman's role in society in Africa? Yeah. And you trace back that armies would never go to battle without a woman being a general. Yeah. This is our history in Africa. And queens ruled nations in Africa and not because their husband died or whatever but because, because they owned that right yeah. to be queens yeah. so this is a type of history we need to be teaching our fellow people, peers and people so that you then understand the fundamental role of okay I am a husband sure you might recognize me as a provider per se but who's the chief advisor I bring the finances back home and we work amongst each other because a woman understands the dynamics of everything. A woman knows what's happening in her husband's family, in her family, her cousin's family, everything. The entire diaspora of what's happening. So um, as much as the wisdom of a woman is needed, especially in this time, you need to also bring it back to your marriage in that way. Okay. Well, there we have it, but we're not really done. We're actually far from it. Yeah? yeah. So this this whole situation came about as, as we stated earlier when uh, WHP's wife, widow, now took the family to court because she recognized herself as his wife, right? And then now it came out, this this whole dialogue of okay, the Lobola negotiations have to happen. Yeah. But if the Lobola negotiations happen and the wife is not presented to the guy's family in regards to if they don't take her 
into the family home, Correct. it's not recognized as customary marriage. Like the whole process is not is not complete. Is that fair? Um, there's certain things you need to follow in tradition in yeah. order to comply with them. And for example, prime example is in many cultures it's believed that once you the low bola has been paid and all of that, even if you've been presented to the family, she needs to stay at the family home for, like for a for couple a of yeah, yeah. For probably three to six months period. Mm. And she needs to have the duke on, she needs to wear jali and all of that. There's a certain dress code that she needs to show that she's recently gotten married mm. and no other man should try and approach her. And these are the particular things that should have happened. And if these things didn't happen, then customary law wise, traditionally wise, um, then she did not really complete the process of being a wife. Even though maybe she can be recognized by the state, but then you need to remember that traditional leaders have powers as well in the constitution and customary laws have also that branch that supports the this country. So what happens when the constitutional law and the customary law clash? Which do you fall back on? Do you go, yes, constitutional, yes, customary? Um, well, or do we keep at, on arguing? At the moment, the constitution does recognize customary law. So that, that means they kind of work coincide yeah. with one another. But how we implement that is another story. Because you have cases such as students who would miss an exam because I had to go to my Sangoma, but now I can't provide proof of evidence that yeah. my Sangoma wrote a note. So how do I then present this that I was there? Yeah. And it's quite different from your Western medical doctors who can provide a note. With a note yeah. So this is the challenge that we're currently facing right now, or allowing your son to go to initiation school and miss a particular exam because you know that's the date he has to go in. Where do we then accommodate these kind of... Because this is also part of customary law. This is part of the traditional powers that chiefs in our country have. So we still need to cushion around that. And um, you'll see cases such as the land expropriation that, that's happening, where chief comes out and says, you're not going to expropriate my land. That's a power they have. Mm -hmm. Or you have cases such as a movie is released today, tomorrow it's removed because it incites some form of disrespect considered yeah. to particular ritual practices, the release of Ingaiba. So yeah. that was removed by the traditional council of leaders. So um, these are the powers that they hold. And we still need to question around how do we then accommodate all of these different powers. Okay. Now, you've been exposed to a whole lot of international organizations and you've traveled um, greatly. Now, do you, when you look at South Africa's situation in, in relation to your other countries that you've been to, and like you were at the Royal Reed Dance, you know, you, you saw how they embraced uh, this cultural practice, which actually is quite controversial, you know, but they embrace it and they practice it with honor and with pride. And then you went to the US uh, where you had the different countries and how people just exist and they live yeah. and they just choose which. Uh, practice or cultural tradition to follow, you know. Some have sentimental value to it, some just go, yeah, but I want to live like this, you know. Um, in regards to South Africa, where on the spectrum do you believe we are? Are we where we literally embrace our cultures? Are, are we quick to do away with our cultures for something more, more fun, more fulfilling, you know? Yeah. Or do we just take the easy way out, whatever sounds easy? If it's in the traditional side, I'll go that way. If it's in the western side, I'll go that way. Okay, so South Africa is a very unique country, um, if, especially if you look at it in the context of how we embrace our traditions, especially what you've just mentioned. Um, I have a friend in Mozambique, and Mozambique has their own indigenous languages, right? Prior to Portuguese being endorsed because of colonization. Mm. And she mentioned to me that, you know, Rance, I don't know this indigenous language, and my grandmother is the only one that knows it. And if she goes away, it's done for that language. Mm. This is a reality a lot of African countries face, and a lot of African countries do not really remember what kind of rituals and practices they used to have traditionally as Africans. Mm. So, here south, when they come to South Africa, you know, you have my friends from Congo, Malawi, and all of that, and they come to South Africa and they say, you know, it's very quite interesting on how South Africans will be so proud that I'm Zulu, I'm proud that I'm John, I'm proud that I'm Betty. Um, we are basically the lost strand and it is so important for us to keep the strand that we ripple effected across the entire African continent that they remember who they truly were. Um, a prime example, especially when you mention the modern times and the traditional times, 
a lot of people confuse that our traditional practices cannot be conformed to the modern, that we shouldn't leave them back behind. They don't forget that Western times themselves aren't new times. They're just a continuation of their own back then, but then in a whole new different society and setting. So Samoa, an example, their, how they embrace their culture, you can see it in their rugby, they have their tattoos, and it's part of them, and it's been part of them, it's a tribal thing for centuries. The Netherlands as well, um, actually New Zealand, you can just see it in the, how they embrace it in the sports and everything, the yeah. haka and everything. Yeah. So that's how they incorporated their tribal nature into the modern into times. The modern how times. do we do that as South Africans? In fact, as Africans. That's your question. How do we do that as South Africans or as Africans? You do go check us out at twi on Twitter at Campus TV is a where we will have a poll in regards to this matter. And the guest that we had here who had so much to say, you know, and please, 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 please don't just go on Twitter and check out the poll. Do go on Twitter and follow at Campus TV as a Facebook as well and subscribe to this YouTube channel. And guys, remember we have a website www.mycampustv.co.za. Now, take care of yourselves, love each other, and let's meet again next week.